All right, welcome, binary and non-binary friends. I'm here with my good friend Leila Meyer, and who is a phenomenal dancer. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about. I mean, we're just going to have a casual conversation, and we're going to talk about uh, relationships between um, how we view our identity and our music. Um, you know, explore the dance world a little bit, and really, whatever, uh, wherever the conversation goes. So, Leila, it's great uh, having you here, um, and welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> All right, I'm still surprised there are people here, honestly. That's great. Right. I also can see nobody, but I, I trust that you're there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can hear me okay, though, right? Yeah, I can do it. Okay, great. Let's minimize that. Okay, and I'm going to pull up the YouTube video on my phone so that I can view the chat. Um, so give me one quick second, please. But yeah, while we get started, while, while I pull this up, why don't you um, kind of introduce yourself, um, talk a little bit about you know, your professional career as a dancer and the work you've done, and um, some projects, some notable projects you've done, uh, and anything else you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, so my name is Layla. I was born in Tennessee and then danced in the D.C. area. And I recently moved to New York. So I'm a teacher, choreographer, writer, researcher, all of the above kind of thing. Um, most recently, I've been working on a project called Shahrazad Retold. So I am um, particularly interested in looking at concert dance in the West, specifically ballet dances and exploring Orientalism that's um, kind of embedded within the foundation of it. So I was working on that and I'm still working on that despite COVID. And then I am also working as an esteemed Kala fellow and um, continuing to kind of explore the, the relationship between um, identity and dance and um, also exploring how gender and um, all of these different ideas intersect within that. Awesome. And I have the chat open up right now. So if anyone has any questions at all while we're talking, please feel free to put them in the chat and uh, you know, also feel free to contribute to the conversation however you'd like. All right, cool. So now I am a musician, as people know, um, and you know we. It's it's really interesting. A lot of composers, I feel like, don't interact with other arts mediums. Um, but I'm curious. Have you gotten to work with uh, composers in the past or other artists? Um, in like a collaboration? Do you have an, um, and if so, what has your experience been like with that? You know, I actually been thinking about this a lot because it seems like in, I guess I can't speak to every experience, but in my experience in like the Western realm of the performing arts in the way that dance was treated for me, it was very compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. It was like, you have dance and then you have music and they're in the same building and you never really interact mm -hmm. with each other weird because I think it's very much like a Western concept. I was doing, I was actually researching just like American dance history recently, just on a tangent. And I noticed that the kind of age where we got away from musician interaction was kind of like disco era. Huh. And since then it's like when people say collaboration, it's a big buzzword, but nobody actually collaborates. Whereas huh. in other dances and art forms, it's like, I mean, the drums are like the rhythm of dance and you would think that they are always together. So like in belly dance, of course, you're collaborating at every second of the dance. But right. here um, it's pretty much the dance or the music and either one just kind of like complements the other. Like dance comes mm -hmm. on top of music or music comes on top of dance. Right. But I, I am missing that a lot. Yeah. No, that, uh, I mean, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And even how, like, today, what we're looking at with the poetry, we have the poem first and then the music. Um, 
kind of with that. Um, but uh, I'm totally with you on, especially on the idea that this kind of compartmentalization and separation between artistic genres, um, I think it was one is definitely Western um, and unusual, um, for sure. Uh, and in fact, probably closer to sacrilegious in some other communities. Um, but it's, I feel like what, what like the lack of that um, collaboration does is also, you know, I mean, it creates less valuable art um, in some ways. Uh, and also kind of, I feel like it hurts our careers and our reach well, or not hurt, but limits them in a way because we have our own communities and they sort of, I don't know, I'm just thinking it was like, it would be really nice if they interacted more with each other. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder, like they're so niche that I don't even think people recognize how to collaborate. Right. Also, we're so poorly funded that like the idea of paying those people is just- <laughs> I know. <laughs> that I get, yeah. And like even training, like I, I think it's kind of strange that when I talk to musicians who um, are in forms that, I mean, Western musicians that train in anything like jazz or anything like that, they still don't have much knowledge of dance. Right. And frankly, I don't know as much music theory as I should. And I think it just makes us worse performers. I, I don't understand why we compartmentalize it. It just seems like we like to categorize something so that we can market it in, an, in a nice little package, but right. everything really intersects with each other if it's good. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, this project on Scheherazade, um, and I'd really love to hear like more about that. Uh, what kind of, and you said you're, you know, you're exploring themes of, uh, appropriation, is that right? And exoticism. Um, yeah, I, I'd really like to explore that a bit more because it's it's very, like from my experience, first time I listened to Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade, I was just thinking like, like okay, this is nice. Um, and then like there were conversations on cultural appropriation on it. Um, and uh, but then I got to Lebanon and it was, one of the only classical pieces my family knew, um, and they loved it. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I'm really curious on just uh, what what your thoughts on on how you're going to um, present that narrative in dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the ballet itself is really um so essentially it came out during the, the belle epoque era um and so what was in vogue essentially was orientalism and so in the ballet well, the actual story is based off of 1001 arabian nights and um it explores scheherazade who is this heroine and she um tells all these stories to prevent this king from um, beheading a different woman each night because he got cheated on. So naturally the only thing to do is to kill every woman so they can't cheat on him again. Classic move. Um, and so instead of actually using any of that story, they focus on the very first like prologue in the ballet. And it just features this female character named Zabida who um, basically is having an orgy so the, the fact that it's called Scheherazade really doesn't even make any sense because uh, she never makes an appearance in the ballet. So the whole ballet is just one long orgy and it plays into all kinds of different stereotypes. And um, it's also interesting because it's changed over time. It's actually, it always has the same ideas, but you know, it's disguised in a different way. So like post 9-11, the, the stereotypes did change and, and there mm. are things that you notice differently. Um, but they always have a female who is completely exoticized and then um, the male role is like this 
idiot who gets tricked and deceived and is overly sexualized and there's always a hookah and it's it's really just plays into Islamophobia too but um, it recaptures this idea that in, in the ballet world if they want to explore the idea of sex it has to be masqueraded as like a cultural drag right. you can't actually explore sex unless you're outside of the realm of the puritanical eye right. um, and it's really damaging it, it's just used the west like ideas to perpetuate what they want to do and are unwilling to do and makes us appear really bad. But I've also noticed that it is very recognizable, um, even in Lebanon. And mm -hmm. I wonder why that is, because I don't think it's based in any fact. I almost feel like sometimes it's self-appropriation. It's like, hey, we're included in something. Right. Right. Um, just because if somebody knows where we are, that's really exciting. I mean, my God, Shahrazad is like, also, it's the original is supposed to be based in China, the actual mm -hmm. story itself. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I actually did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in Rimsky Korsakov, I've heard a podcast of, about his work, and they were saying that he was, you know, it was so authentic and. Um, to what? When really it just reflects every tenet of, of Orientalism. <laughs> yeah. Were, who th he himself didn't say it was authentic. He put a note in the score saying it was like, this is not supposed to like mimic the Arabic style. This is purely exoticizing. He like said it himself. Uh, I think he referred to it as like quasi oriental <laughs> Right. But they were saying, uh, this was like a recent podcast. Mm -hmm. They were saying that he was a sailor and so he traveled there and that's why he knew all this. Things. I don't even know what region he's trying to be. Um, right. But yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I I would say I think for like the pop, I think there is definitely a sense of self organizing. Um, and, I, and of course, when I speak about like culture in Lebanon, the only thing I really know is like my family. I don't know. I don't know if that's a Deruz thing or not, but, um, you know, I'm usually not able to see any other culture. <laughs> um, it's usually just kind of being in the mountains, um, and, uh, only seeing your cousins and then being told to get married, but you can only see your cousins. Um, <laughs> it's just all of that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Which is funny. Cause it's also like, the Western self orientalism or the, the Western version of Orientalism is so embedded in Islam that mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what, like the West portrayal of the whole region is, well, it's, it's just wrong too. I mean, I was, I was actually doing some research yesterday on the Arabian dance from the Nutcracker, which um, we had also done a piece with and it was, uh, there's this rendition that it's like a Turkish magician, but it's called the Arabian dance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the research never even mentioned the fact that that was just inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. And musicians, too, I think they just literally don't care. <laughs> yeah, like the research is like, they commented on the fact that they thought it was racist because it was called the Arabian dance and they had, um, a woman disappear through like supernatural magic, mm -hmm. but never actually commented on the region. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, um, my bot's working. Yay. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, so I have a night bot on the chat that just like automatically puts out a message reminding people to donate and it's actually, actually working. Yay. So yay. Um, so we have a couple questions um, and comments. First, I think this is a comment from John's. Um, the more I learn about the satellite Soviet countries and their music cultures, the more a lot of Russian and Soviet music makes sense to me. I don't think many Western trained musicians understand how close to the music of Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the Middle East many of those Russian Soviet composers actually are. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, 
that's actually really exciting to me because I just finished a book about this. Really? Um, curating art in post-Soviet um, Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about identity and the, it's interesting that you brought this up because the original Arabian dance was um, a Georgian lullaby mm -hmm. that yeah. over time has shifted to the Arabian dance. But they were saying that the Ballet Russe's popularity, even though they were based in Paris at the time because they had all defected, mm -hmm. um, their origins were in Russia. But the reason they were met with so much success was because it was considered quasi-Oriental because the West was identifying them as literally like the middle, like the middle grounds. I can't say right. middle because Middle East is, yeah. know, is also just a strange term. Middle of what? You know, east of what? Yeah. You know. But the intermediate yeah. middle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they kind of interact with both. And so their music is indicative of that. And even um, I was doing some Azerbaijani dance and the women, it, it feels very much like Middle Eastern dance. And I could pick that up right away. And then uh, the men's dance was like very Russian and athletic. And I was really glad I did not have to do it because I don't <laughs> think I could. Awesome. So it's interesting how they kind of um, are marginalized in like a way that they're just forgotten. Right. Yeah. Okay, we have one other question from Miles Allen. Um, says, I'm curious about Layla's experiences collaborating, especially with musicians, but with other artists as well, given that it can be fraught as you discussed. Would you want to share any particularly good slash bad collaboration experiences? Yeah, let me bring out my list. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've, I have definitely had some good co collaborations. I would say that most of them have been most fruitful when they're friends. I, I think that's, and that's unfortunate because that it has been a key for me, but specifically with like Middle Eastern influences, I can easily collaborate with people. Um, whereas with something more like, and I think you've probably had this experience. A lot of musicians here are hired to memorize sheet music and then they come in the day of, they perform it alongside the dancers. And to me, that really isn't collaborating. That is somebody hired to learn a job on their own time and then do it later. Right. Um, so I would say that I have not had, I mean, I as a teacher, I collaborate quite a bit with other genres and in productions like musical theater or immersive theater. But I can't say that I've had a lot of dance shows that have, been incredibly fruitful within like the Western modern contemporary realm right. because it just feels like we never have the budget. And for some reason, if it's a cultural mm -hmm. dance form, it seems like people treat it as passion projects, which right. is really unfortunate. But I mean, I think I do it too. I mean, I, I'm excited about it, so I'll do it for free. And I think that my colleagues are the same way. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you've had a similar experience. Yeah, I mean, technically, this event is a passion project. Um, yeah, um, I definitely am not making money <laughs> myself, but we are raising money for Beirut, so this is a good time to remind you all to donate at the link in the that the bot gave you. Um, <laughs> uh, the link's also in the description um, if you want to take a moment. Uh, there's also going to be time after, you know, we do this. Um, that we can, uh, so there's going to be a little break for you to kind of go and scoop your money in. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, as far as like collaborations, I've had, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. Um, it's like, uh, I'm noticing, well, it's, it's sort of weird. So like a lot of my career as a composer is also is a bit stunted because I haven't been able to go to grad school. That's one thing. Um, and I don't live in New York and <laughs> I have not won a major award yet. Um, and so it's like for a composer, that's kind of like the bar you need to be emerging. You have to like first um, 
you have to like first meet all of those things for anyone to even care about your stuff. But I have found a lot more like personal success from um, and fulfilling work in particularly, you know, doing stuff like this mostly. Um, my if some of my most fun work was also just like sending Michal like some crappy first drafts I made to practice uh, for this. Um, and also writing stuff on my own time. Um, I haven't found many musicians who... Um, that, that's a, another weird thing is that like for a composer, I, I have not... I've almost rarely met someone who was willing to play a work that I have already written. Um, but some of those same folks are come to me asking for commission. So folks really want like works written explicitly for them. Um, and, you know, I've been playing around with styles quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I would say my most fruitful collaborations have also been with um, f friends or people I know personally. Um, or throughout, or I make sure that throughout the process, we at least get to know each other very well. Um, and it's usually from there that, you know, I figure out, decide, was like, okay, how much do I want to explore versus how new music-y do I want to make this and that kind of stuff. Um, I also yeah. think that most of them, now that I'm thinking about it, in the, like the Nina Swana kind of community. <laughs> right. Um, which is interesting just because I'm seeing that as a trend in, in my work and I wonder if that is a reflection of people who, you know, the communities that we kind of form within ourselves. Right. Yeah, I mean, totally. Uh, like, I mean, I don't know. From my perspective, it also feels like there is almost no one out there for us. So we got to be, <laughs> so we got to be there for each other. Uh, so I'm also curious about how your work might relate to community and community building, because that is a general theme of this whole event is, you know, we're trying to build solidarity, we're trying to build community, we're bringing people from different sources together. Um, do you approach kind of communal conversations in your work? And if so, how do you kind of go about it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that right now I have been doing, well, prior to COVID, I think that was everything. I think that right was the essence of, of art making. And that's something that we're all kind of trying to recreate in as a substitute. I don't know that I love being able to do like interviews and things like this, which I hadn't done before as often, mm -hmm. but community building is, is the, the reason, a huge reason to dance. I mean, there's dance for art and, you know, for proscenium stages and all that, but also there's, dance for love and fulfillment and bringing people together. I mean, the Dead Sea in and of itself is that that's a reflection of that, um, right. people coming together. So yeah, I think that as an educator, that's my sole purpose is to bring people together and um, celebrate our bodies and our likeness and our differences. But um, as a choreographer, I also explore it just through the fact that you're trying to do something that is well researched and intentional. I, I think that's the word I've been using as I am kind of a people will reach out to me and ask for my their thoughts on their work. And I think that the biggest thing is being intentional about your work and knowing where something comes from and um, paying homage to that and not just appropriating it. And it's hard not to, especially with something like Middle Eastern dance when so much of it is appropriated it to the point where it's hard to trace correct origins to anything. Mm -hmm. So I think that by taking the time to actually do all that and the hard work is, is part of the community building that we're doing. Right. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, like, because, you know, when I'm thinking about my work, I'm also trying to think was like, okay, I want to build community, but who is my community? 
Um, and I also have to take sometimes it's like, okay, who is not? Uh, and it's very weird because like in the new music community, in some ways it's like not very much not, but they're also the style I take and um, in some cases or some techniques I use. Um, and also they're the ones who have a lot more money than um, some other like things. So it's tricky. I'm wondering if you've had to navigate that kind of thing where let's say there's like a donor or a patron or something. Um, and yeah, how you go about having community conversations um, with people you want to connect to versus people who are kind of uh, in some way expecting you to speak to them um, instead. Yeah, I, I think that right now um, that's a major issue in my career. I think people are going to find this hard to believe, but the best artists aren't always the ones that are most popular. <laughs> <laughs> no. They're creating some really bad work and we're not questioning it because of their name. But right. I think that has been really hard for me because I find it difficult to say no to something if there is if there's financial support involved it's hard to say no I won't do that right because there's so little money in the arts but sometimes it is tainted so uh -huh. I wonder what our responsibility is as an artist as um, somebody that's participating in other work sometimes um, I'm a dancer and a choreographer's vision and I am well aware that I am being portrayed in a way that isn't exactly accurate but also it's it's money and i i have a hard time kind of towing that line even more so now during covid just because it's like you know the job i was trained and i love and i'm passionate about is being like wiped out the performing arts are right. being wiped out right now um so just wear your mask stop not wearing like I have no job. That was my passion and it's been taken away. Right. I, I've also been a little hostile on subways lately. You can't tell. I totally but get yeah, it. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to, to rationalize which roles you take, which roles you don't, which jobs you take, where you're just the token. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Naturally, that's really tough. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and I'm with you on that. I've well, I've had some tough conversations with folks about masks. Um, you know, you'd you'd expect some people who come from a culture where, or um, some people who themselves might be conservative, um, but also are like glorify covering up. Um, <laughs> it's like you gotta wear you gotta wear the hijab and you gotta cover your face. Um, they'd say that or like. In my family, it's more like, those are the most holy people and you got to aspire to be like them. And then you ask them to wear a mask and they're like, uh, excuse me, no, if I'm going to die, I'm just going to die. <laughs> Here's your chance. Yeah, I also think people are just so stubborn about it. Like, right. Yeah, this is your chance to be the most holy. By covering <laughs> right. your mouth. Uh. This is the the next step in the grand Shakira law um, scheme. <laughs> Still not over that day. That was on. It was like it was. It was making. I think it was a parody. I'm not really yeah. sure. It's hard to tell. At least, but they were saying that this is um, like the whole idea and the concept of wearing a mask is a ploy to like the. COVID was a hoax and that this is all to get people to cover up and it's going to lead to like full on Islam in the mm -hmm. United States. Yeah. Because oh. that's what Islam is. <laughs> yeah. My favorite meme that came from that is like, if, if you rearrange the letters of COVID-19 and you change some of the letters, they spell Islam. Um, <laughs> I think it was like uh, they changed it to like Covil 19 or something like that. Uh, 
and got ready to see. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's really odd. I mean, I still hear so much like xenophobia. Even right. I, I did watch both town halls, and it was painful. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's still so tied to racism and the idea mm -hmm. of a mask is so politicized right now that it's just incredible. I just that science can be such a political thing when it is based in so much fact and also we, we see people and we know people and right yeah it's uh yeah we'll see what surprises 2020 brings further oh yeah i just can't wait it's just a yeah. never-ending roller coaster right <laughs> roller coasters yeah i'm yeah i'm anticipating probably Okay, my guess for the next three months. Um, November. Uh, November. Um, I do actually think Biden will win, and then there will be a coup, and then that'll be that thing. December is when the aliens come, and then uh, <laughs> January 1st, 2021 is when the nukes come out. That's my prediction. Oh, God, I don't even know what to think anymore. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I like always made fun of people that would like hide the money under, you know, like people who hide mm -hmm. the money and then like, the banks are all wrong and all this stuff. And I'm like, mm, maybe you have a point. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's, I've been very much on that mode lately. Right. Uh, have another comment from the queer Arabs podcast. LOL. Ha 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 ha. WTF. Ah. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, honestly, like, CNN pundits should just be saying that. <laughs> what else is there to report on? Yeah, they're tired. I feel bad for... Right. My heart goes out to even, like, SNL writers. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't funny anymore. This is just terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we have, like, a few minutes left, and I know you have something you wanted to share and present um but before that is there anything else you just like to say or about or talk about this is a great event the yeah. only marathon i would ever participate in <laughs> same <laughs> um and donate because this is so important to us and to the world and um you know lebanon is very accustomed to this kind of treatment but um they shouldn't be. Right. And so because of capitalism, your money will go a long way. So whatever you have, please give. Awesome. All right. And uh, would you like to, uh, so I'm going to get the thing set up, um, but would you like to give an introduction to what the dance you're going to share with us? It's... So this was um, kind of beginning of my journey into this. Um, it's called Lawi, and it's a piece that it explores um, different folk traditions in the Middle East and also combines contemporary dance. And so I thought this was interesting to revisit because it's changed quite a bit um, since then. But it's just to fuse a piece and to kind of investigate internally which one is taking precedence over the other and trying to make sure that they're merged in a way that is intentional and well done um, was something extremely important to me. And so I'm continuing to toe this line of, of these different identities and that is what this piece is. Awesome. All right. Well, it was great having you here. I'm going to need a quick minute of just holding holding while I get the video set up. Um, so folks can expect just like a quick 30 seconds of seeing that picture of me again. Um, but yeah, this was fantastic, a lot of fun and a great first break in this uh, composing marathon. So thank you so much for being here. And um, oh, one other thing I just wanted to quickly like bring up.
I was also like, Arthur is this. And really, I just have like, I just have a message I just want to send out to any family that might be watching this. Please, stop trying to get us to marry in Lebanon. We're dating. <laughs> <laughs> friends who are always asking about the religion and we're like like I kind of like to pretend when we I allude to the fact that it's just a really kept well kept secret that we just like right. part once a week right. and it's not actually a religion at all and I think they're kind of starting to be convinced so I'm working on that angle awesome I just make up a completely different lie every time um it's like yeah we believe in like the Six and a halfness of God, and <laughs> it's like that. Yeah, um, there are some truths I tell, but um, you know the the ones that everyone knows. Like I consider information on Wikipedia. Actually, I just consult Wikipedia because that's also like only about twenty percent true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Is a lot of fun messing with people. <laughs> like our secrets, though. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was really great, um, and I did learn a lot, so thank you. All right, we're gonna end this, um, you're gonna quickly see my OBS screen, uh, and then gonna pull up the video. All right. Bye.